Ilahi ta'ala, correct your intentions. I ask Allah to make this easy for me and for you. We're continuing here in the lucid word, going over the obligatory knowledge. The author says, section 15, clarifying the nullifiers of prayer. Nullifier here means invalidator. So that's where we don't usually use, it's fine. The prayer is nullified by uttering any expression within the broad scope of human speech. Yani, the prayer is nullified by normal speech, regular speech. Excluding dhikr, dhikr is not going to invalidate the prayer in any position. And excluding supplication, as long as that's not a supplication that involves talking to someone. Like if you said in your prayer to someone, Allahu yahdik, that means may Allah guide you. This will invalidate your prayer. Although it's a dua, but because of talking to someone. And this does not include saying, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Peace be upon you, O Prophet. Because this is a sanctioned part of the prayer in the first place. That is a part of the prayer sanctioned by the, the, the sacred law. And reciting the book of God, Yani, and ayah of the Quran is not going to invalidate the prayer. This nullifies the prayer if a person does so voluntarily. Voluntarily means not forced. Remembering that one is praying Yani, he's conscious of the fact that he's praying. And knowing that doing so is prohibited. Knowing that this is haram invalidates the prayer. But not knowing that it's haram does not invalidate the prayer. The prayer is nullified by speaking in as much as two letters. I don't recall ever seeing this written as one word before. The prayer is nullified by speaking in as much as two letters. Yani, by speaking as much as two letters. Two Arabic letters, that's the standard. Whether they carry a meaning or not. Or by uttering a single letter which carries a meaning. Yeah, what that basically boils down to, the two letters, is two consonants. Two consonants. Yeah, need, that's an approximation for you. Because you'd say in English, for example, if you spell B, E, you'd say B. So you might think that's two letters. So this is one letter, which is Ba. Ba of Kesra, B. You can say ba, bu, bi. That's all the same letter there. Whether they carry a meaning or not, those two letters. So if those two letters don't carry any meaning, then it would be an utterance or a pronunciation but it's meaningless. So that's like akin to a gibberish. Or by uttering a single letter which carries a meaning. One letter that has a meaning. Like what? Like saying ra. Ra. That means C. S E E. That's a command. Or saying fi. Fi. That means fulfill. Not fi. Fi. Or saying ti. That means protect. So it has meaning.
Uh, how's the voice? How's the voice? Good voice, inshallah. Good voice, good voice. Okay, so maybe that person can go out and come back in. Barakallahu feekum. So, or by uttering a single letter which carries a meaning. Unless the person forgets that he is praying when he says what he says. And the statements uttered are few, such as six phrases or statements by customary standards or less. Yes. The way they usually say it in Arabic is six words. But word means, in that context, word means statement. So that's like a person was praying, he forgot he was praying, so he said to someone, take this money go to the store buy some bread bring it back and put it on the table so that was five that i just said for you and the statements uttered are few such as six phrases by customary standards or less In which case, their yani, one's prayer is not nullified because he forgot and he said a little bit. But what if he forgot and he said a lot? Then his prayer will be nullified because now this is a rare excuse. The second nullifier is performing many moves. Uh, so, yeah, I did express before. I think it would be nicer if these are broken instead of all squashed into one long paragraph. I think it's easier to digest and easier to reference to. Helps a person be able to look skim. So he can find something. The second nullifier is performing many moves. The Shafi'i scholars differed on or about what is defined as many moves. Yani, so performing many moves means moves that are foreign to the prayer. Moves that are outside of the prayer format. Which, according to some scholars, many moves are continuous movements lasting for the duration of one cycle, one rakat. Let me look at the sentence again. It says, the second nullifier is performing many moves. The Shafiri scholars, and I'd say, capitalize that the Shafiri scholars differed about what is defined as many moves which according to some scholars many moves are continuous movements lasting for the duration of one rakat so this sentence because they're attempting to uh, translate merged Arabic Something, you know, in the Arabic, there's the original mukhtasar, the original text. It's, the explanation is al qawlul jali. The explanation is weaved, weaved in with the original text. Like you can see here, the bold part is the original text and the lighter part is the explanation weaved in. 
But originally that's in Arabic. So what's in Arabic is fine. But when it got translated here, it needs adjustment. I'm not going to take the time here to fix this sentence. But it can be fixed. It just needs a little bit of nuance, inshallah ta'ala. You say, if a person has a condition of tics, would that be okay? Then this is out of his control. This is not, he's not performing those moves. Just like your heartbeat, you don't perform that. That's not a deed of yours. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. So he says, according to some scholars, many moves are continuous movements lasting for the duration of one cycle. So that's the saying in the Shafi'i school that how many foreign moves will ruin your prayer? Invalidate it. As many moves as what takes the time of an entire raka. That's a saying in the Shafiri school. Another saying is that three consecutive motions nullify the prayer, even if performed with different limbs of the body, such as walking three conse consecutive steps, or such as lifting your hand to scratch your head and bringing it back down. That's one. So doing that three times consecutively would invalidate your prayer according to this saying. The latter is the famous ruling in the school of Ash-Shafi'i, here's a typo. In the school of Ash-Shafi'i, Yani, this one we're saying now, three moves, that's the famous saying, that's the popular saying in the Shafi'i school. There are other legal opinions as well. The Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, said, However, the first saying, i.e., performing many moves, as, I think that's supposed to be as here, performing many moves as what would add up to the duration of one rakat, is supported by stronger evidence. He's saying, although it's not the popular saying in the Shafi'i school, the evidence for it, as compared to the evidence for the other one, is stronger. So that's important for you to understand, to take a broad, general understanding of that issue there. Because our Shaykh is a man of evidence. Some people are people of masses. Not talking about following Ahlul Sunnah at large, that's obligatory. Based on the evidence, that's obligatory, not because it's a vote. But our religion doesn't go by the it's not a vote. The issues not the issues are not by a vote. Yani, the religious judgments. You so say, what if the baby keeps crawling away? Can you keep picking it up? Well, that falls into what I said. Whatever I told you. Now, I just told you two sayings. So then means you have to work around that. Because if you do too many moves, that means really you're, you, you're, it's like you broke the prayer. Because you can't put foreign moves into the prayer. The prayer has its own format. So that's what you want to avoid. You want to avoid disrupting the prayer's form.
So the first one has stronger evidence because it conforms with the apparent meaning of some hadiths, such as the hadith in which the Prophet wasallam was praying when Aisha came and he moved within his prayer to let her in. The proof being that it usually takes more than three moves to perform such a thing. So the evidence points to that stronger saying that's more than three moves. It takes more than three moves to invalidate the prayer. The third nullifier is performing a single excessive movement. Now, if maybe they didn't break these apart because they want to compact the book. So if that's the goal, then, then th that's a goal. That could be someone's goal. It wants the book to not be wide. The third nullifier is performing a single excessive movement such as jumping, leaping. This will invalidate the prayer. The fourth nullifier is adding an extra physical integral intentionally, such as performing two rukors in one raka'ah. So this Arabic word doesn't need to be here. Because this Arabic word is not being even represented here. So it doesn't have to be there. It's enough just to say two rukors in one raka'ah. In an obligatory prayer. Or three sujuds in one raka'ah. And therefore, if you prostrate at the end of the prayer for no reason, this will invalidate your prayer because this will be counted as adding an integral of action or physical integral. Adding a physical integral invalidates the prayer. Some people prostrate at the end of their prayer saying, just in case. So that's a bad idea. Rather, learn. And then act by knowledge. The fifth nullifier is performing a move with the purpose of playing. Even if it were not excessive. Because playing invalidates the intention. So it will invalidate your prayer. The sixth nullifier is eating or drinking, i.e. ingesting food or drink into the body cavities, except if one forgets that one is praying, and it's, i.e. what one ate or drank is little. Yani, you can compare your state of being in ihram of prayer like a fasting person. You're like a fasting person when you pray. You cannot eat or drink until you get out of the prayer. Eating or drinking, even a little bit, will invalidate your prayer. Except if one forgets that one is praying and it, i.e., what one ate or drank is little. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam. Um, can you swallow your spit? Yes, you can swallow your own pure saliva. As long as there's nothing mixed in there. Like if somebody was eating candy, so he has color in his mouth. Now he can't swallow that saliva. As long as there's color there. Thank you. You're welcome. Not mucus. This will invalidate the prayer. Only pure saliva. Not mucus means not something that comes up from your chest. If it comes up from your chest, past your throat, into your mouth, you cannot swallow it back down. 
Or if it comes from your head down into your mouth, you can't swallow it. You have to spit it out or pray with it in your mouth. But not if something came up from your stomach, though, that's different. Something came up from your stomach, got into your mouth, this will invalidate your prayer. Something came up from your chest, got into your mouth, will not invalidate your prayer. If, as long as you don't swallow it back down. If something came down from your head into your mouth, will not invalidate your prayer as long as you don't swallow it. But if something came up from your stomach into your mouth, right there, that's going to break your prayer. He says, so phlegm from nasal cavity is also not the one swallowed. Yani, that's the stuff that came from your head. I, I covered everything, yes. So the stuff comes down from your head. You got basically three spots. Either it's going to come down from your head, or it's going to come from your chest, or it's going to come from your stomach. If it comes from your head or your chest, you can't swallow it. If it comes from your stomach, it just breaks your prayer anyway. You're welcome. So the sixth nullifier is eating or drinking, ingesting food or drink into the body cavities. So that's not even restricted to the mouth. Like Just like fasting. Except if one forgets that he's praying. And it's only a little bit what he ate or drank. As opposed to fasting itself though. Because if you're fasting and you forgot you were fasting and you ate and drank a lot, let's say a whole pot, let's say all meals of the day, and then you remembered you were fasting, then your fast is not broken. So for the fast, it's not a condition that's only a little bit. But for the prayer, it's a condition that it's only a little bit. One forgot he was praying, so he ate and drank a little bit. Then his prayer is not invalidated. Why? Because, Yanni, what's the difference? The difference is that uh, fasting does not have any special words or moves that remind you that you're fasting. And so forgetting that you're fasting is not far-fetched even to the extent that a person forgets all day. But prayer does have special moves and words that makes it far-fetched for a person to forget extensively that he's praying. He's not going to forget all day that he's praying. So that's why he's only allowed to forget a little bit and maintain the validity of his prayer. As opposed to fasting. You said, I may have missed the response. What about moving a baby repeatedly because she keeps crawling? Yes, my answer to you was that a person has to not break the form of the prayer. What I mentioned to you, this is this is it. Siani. There's not another, there's not more leeway than what I just told you. There's two sayings here. Yani. That is, this is what we're teaching, this is what we have learned. These two sayings. Three moves invalidate the prayer three foreign moves consecutive will invalidate the prayer so that means if the baby moved and then he moved and the baby moved and then he moved consecutively and then the baby moved so he moved consecutively this is going to invalidate his prayer according to the other saying as many moves as what takes up the time of an entire raka that means consecutively also so same thing so if the baby moved so many times, if he did three moves because of this baby, then he broke his prayer according to that saying. So then he's going to say, I better take the other saying because my dealing with this baby has made me break my prayer according to a saying. And like this. You said, for example, if I were to add an extra sujud because I was, on, I was only certain that I did one sujud, then I did a prostration of forgetfulness after that, the salat, this would be valid. Yes. Yani, yes, because the meaning of your question here is to allude to invalidating sujood of forgetfulness altogether. So, of course, if a person had the reason, then he can do it. That's why it's sanctioned. But if he has no reason, he just does it, this will invalidate his prayer altogether because he'll be adding 
uh, he'll be adding uh, a rukun, an integral of action. Inshallah, is clear for you. And by the way, when I answer you brothers and sisters, sometimes I'll say your question alludes to this or that. I hope it won't, it doesn't, it's not offensive to you. Yani, those things, I've, I just think they're important to bring those out. It's not to belittle your, your questions or anything like that. But it's important because sometimes if you think about those things, we'll even maybe sometimes answer your question for you. You said, and this would be valid if I have the slightest doubt. So you're asking about the rules of sujud sahu. What are the rules for sujud of prostration? So sujud of prostration has its rules. If a person fulfills them, fulfills the conditions of that, then he can do it. If he doesn't like, he just, because he doesn't know, what I'm saying, when I say he has, he's just saying just in case, what I mean is he doesn't know the rules. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't know the rules. So he's saying just in case I did something, I'm going to make two sujuds. So he just does two sujuds and he doesn't even know what he's doing or why or if he should. He's doing it just in case only, not out of observing proper rules. This will invalidate his prayer. And... Shake. what if he can't remember? So then, if a person has doubt, the rule is you abandon the doubt and you go by what's certain. Better clothing. I mean, what fecal. Uh, here, the author says, the seventh nullifier is intending to interrupt the prayer immediately or later. That's clear. The eighth nullifier is deciding to interrupt one's prayer if such a thing occurs that means making interrupting the prayer contingent meaning dependent upon something happening for example intending to interrupt one's prayer upon the arrival of Zaid that means he's saying if Zaid comes I will stop praying if a customer knocks on the door or knocks on the window I will stop praying uh, if the uh, food delivery guy knocks on the door, I'm going to stop praying. Let me start real quick. Maybe I'm going to miss the prayer, but I'm going to, if he comes, I'm going to stop praying. Then the prayer is invalidated from such an intention or such a decision. Also, the prayer is immediately nullified by merely hesitating about interrupting the prayer. That means he's saying, should I or shouldn't I? Stop praying. Unlike an involuntary thought which does not result in hesitation or a decision to interrupt the prayer. Just if it crossed your mind to interrupt your prayer doesn't mean your prayer is invalidated. Someone told me that someone gave him a very bad advice. Yanni, what I'm calling a very bad advice. Told him, if it crossed your mind that you invalidated your prayer, you invalidated your prayer. Don't think about it. You know, shoot, what kind of advice is that? And that person thought it was a good advice too. How are you going to not think about what you are doing? Lastly, So he said, this does not affect the prayer's validity. Lastly, to complete an integral of the prayer while the doubt persists. Whether or not one has established... This comma is in the wrong place here. No comma. While the doubt persists, whether or not... One has established the intention to perform the prayer... In the opening statement, Allahu Akbar. While the doubt persists, whether or not one has established the intention to perform the prayer. In the opening statement, Allahu Akbar. 
such as moving from a physical integral to another physical integral while still in doubt of the said intention. Meaning here, very simple. A person has a doubt about his intention. Is, does he have a valid intention? Did he validly intend? Okay. Merely doubting if you intended validly is not invalid. Because you might remember sh shortly after that, and this will make your prayers stay valid. You might remember, say, yes, I intended properly. Okay. So, no problem. What's going to invalidate your prayer? If you are doubting about your intention, and while doubting, you move from one integral to another. Transferring out of an integral to another integral, while doubting about the validity of your intention, invalidates your prayer altogether. Doesn't matter how long you've been doubting, even if it was a short time. You just started doubting right at the end of your Fatiha, and then you went into Rukor. It was just a moment's doubt, but you did doubt about the validity of your intention, and you moved from one, in one integral to another. This invalidates your prayer. Or if the duration of that doubt is long, regardless of whether or not one moved to another physical integral. Yani, or, this means, or having a long doubt about the intention. So, having a short doubt about the intention without moving into a new integral will not invalidate the prayer. That's the synopsis. Having a short doubt about the intention without transferring from one integral to the other. So, What's excluded by that? Having a long doubt about the intention will invalidate your prayer or having a short doubt while transferring from one integral to another. This also nullifies the prayer Wallahu ta'ala a'lam uh, I think we could squeeze this in here. Section 16, clarifying the conditions for the rewardableness of prayer. Rewardableness. That's new for me. I know rewardability. Maybe that's the correct word. In addition to what has been previously mentioned of the conditions. In order for the prayer to merit reward from Allah that's nice i.e. for the individual praying to be granted reward from Allah yani not merely fulfilling the obligation but to actually get the reward for the prayer it is a condition to perform the prayer exclusively for the sake of Allah that means sincerely without seeking the praise of people for praying or else one would be committing the sin of insincerity. That's a major sin. A major sin that nullifies the reward. It is also a condition for one's food. One's food in his abdomen while praying. Here, you can take out. That, all of that, you can just say his. It is also a condition for one's food in his abdomen while praying. Maybe add here. His clothing worn while praying and place of prayer. To be permissible. Yeah, these, these, these sentences could use some improvement, inshallah ta'ala. So, it's also a condition that the food in your stomach is lawful for the reward of your prayer. Uh, what I learned is that this does not include if a person ingested marijuana, that's what I know in particular. I didn't hear about something else. 
meaning what's the meaning here meaning is there's something in his body that's where the question was something is in his body is this like having the haram food in the stomach what i learned that it's not the same as having the haram food in the stomach Yeah, but if you want to check up on that, if you want to ask someone who's qualified to give you a good answer, not anybody, ask, if you want to ask someone like Sheikh Nabil, for example, or someone with a reliable answer, then you can double check that. So it is also a condition for one's food in his stomach and his clothing that he's wearing while praying. His clothing has to be lawful. His food has to be lawful. His clothing has to be lawful. So he's not wearing stolen clothing. He's not wearing women's clothing. And the woman's not wearing men's clothing. And place of prayer would be permissible. So not praying in a place taken by force. Lastly, it is a condition for one to be in awe of Allah during the prayer, even if it is for a moment. I like that, mashallah. In our older translations, original translations, it says, for one to have the fear of Allah. And then there was something clarified for us that, what's this exactly mean? Doesn't exactly mean, for example, being afraid of hell or being afraid of being punished. It means something else. Like here, to be in awe of Allah, I like to say to have reverence for God, to have reverence for Allah during the prayer, even if it is for a moment, yani for only a moment. The more you can hold that feeling, the more rewardable it is for you. So you should be trying that until inshallah, may Allah make us like those pious people who would be holding that in their hearts. From the takbir until the salam. Doesn't cut. Those pious people will be praying and, and, and these real reports, yani cannonballs will be shooting in front of them. And their beard is flying in the wind of the cannonball. And he's still standing there praying. Or also babies. It's reported about that with dealing with the pious people. Baby will be doing something. This pious person is just praying. Or snake comes. This pious person is... All the people run. The pious person isn't even affected there. He doesn't even know what's going on. Hence, if this does not occur throughout the entirety of the prayer, one's prayer is valid. However, without reward. Yani, if a person prayed with insincerity, or he prayed in haram clothing, or with haram food in his stomach, or in a haram place, haram, someone reminded me to make the ra heavy. When I say haram, say how the habits come, you have to break those. Haram. That's why if you say Allah without a ha, you have to break that. Can't say Allah. That's haram. Allah, the ha, you have to fix it. And say Muhammad with a ha, don't say Muhammad. So one's prayer would be valid without reward. The, fe the uh, aforementioned feeling of awe is to feel fearful reverence and glorification of Allah. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, Allah knows best. The Arabic word is khushu'a. Al khushu'a. I'm just saying, the word fear is not the best translation for what we're talking about here. It's the reverence. It's the humility. That's clear. Could you break reverence down more? Respect. That's more clear. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. 
You said if the non Temyi's child aged between two and four come in front of one during the prayers, could you clarify in what instances that would nullify the person's prayer? This doesn't invalidate his prayer. It's not a prayer invalidator for a baby to stand in front of you. Amin Wafiq. Just when you need to make record, you're going to have to move him out the way. Just like it was a cat or something. Just move him out the way. Or you move. To take a step over or back or something. Without invalidating the prayer. Shaykh, well, it does kashua have the same meaning as reverence? Approximately, yes. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It has to have khushua. The khushua is the reverence. That's how I usually translate it. It's translated here in this book as all. So what about any child under the age of Teklif? The question's not clear. If that child stood in front of you, it's not going to invalidate your prayer. It's not a prayer invalidator for a child to stand in front of you. Okay. Uh, moving the fingers and moving the nose and the lips and the ears and the eyes have no effect. Turning the head, I haven't learned anything about that. Or if I did, I didn't. I don't remember it. You said fingers, nose, eyes, and, and lips and ears. Lips and ears. That has no effect moving those. Thank you. You're welcome. Is it permissible to donate blood? Uh, possibly, but I don't know the details. I heard sheikhs informing that there are people, there were Muslims who needed blood donation. And what their blood types were, so that in, if anyone has such a blood type, he could help. So, without me asking him, Yanni, as if it's permissible, I didn't ask him though. The rule is that you can't assume an, a judgment by the action of the scholar. You have to ask him. You have to ask him. You can't see him do something and then assume it's halal. So, I don't remember hearing that. Yeah, I, mean, I remember hearing Sheikh Tariq Laham, for example, making such announcements. So, yeah, I mean, somebody like him, he's not going to do it if it's haram. But you still need to ask, as per the rule. You can't just assume because he did it that it's halal. Any other questions?